It's time. Let's do this. Greeting climbers, trainers, and coffee lovers around the world. It's time for Training Cafe. So grab a cup of uh, coffee, tea, water. Perhaps if you're in Germany, it's time for beer. Whatever your beverage, let's sip together and get this show started. And if you see this coffee mug, perhaps you know what my favorite TV show is, at least comedy show. Um, okay, well, hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, and probably if you were like me, you were quarantined at home uh, because of this uh, situation we're in with a global pandemic. And I don't wanna really get into that whole thing today. Let's be more forward thinking and talk training and, um, uh, hope, uh, hopefully arm you with some material that will help you train more effectively at home and get us all prepared, healthy and strong for when we can return to the climbing gyms and crags of the world. I'm still thinking positive that it's going to be next month here locally where I'm at in Pennsylvania. Uh, we are uh, on a stay at home order through April 30th. And then after that, who knows, we will see. Um, so I'm kind of training and thinking optimistically that I'll be back climbing outside in the month of May. Um, and if not May, June, uh, I'm not ready to give up on this climbing season, that's for sure. Um, and I'm sure you're not either uh, because climbing is uh, such a big part of our lives. And it's something that if you're in the Northern Hemisphere like me, you spent all winter kind of inside. It was cold, snowy, rainy out, and uh, you're looking forward to the sunnier days and the climbing weather. And um and so you're um, anxiously awaiting um, our return to outdoor climbing. So in any case, uh, this episode, we're going to talk uh, about um, some actually follow-ups on the last episode where I delved into hangboard training protocols. I got a lot of follow-up questions. Some of them I answered on YouTube. Um, I see a few people uh, writing in with questions here uh, relating to their hangboard training. I'll try to touch on some of the common ideas or common themes of the questions I've received in the past couple of days in this episode. And uh, in, in future episodes, I'll kind of steer things, I guess, based on the type of feedback I'm getting, the type of questions I'm getting. I know a lot of people, uh, after the last episode, you got a little tour of our home climbing setup here. And I heard uh, a few folks uh, dropping messages about they'd like to see more of that, uh, get a better tour of the facility, um, and maybe even maybe one of these episodes we can do a workout together, or at least I can, you know, maybe do some demos of various exercises. So that's all stuff that's on the drawing board. But I want to kind of wrap up this topic of uh, hangboard training, which is a complex topic. It's not just as simple as hang the board up and start training, but you kind of need to know what you're doing, how much of, you know, what protocol to do, what is appropriate for you. And um, that's something that, um, is uh, you've got to be highly personalized, really, to get it right. And so you don't want the hangboard to turn into the injury board, uh, which does happen if you overuse it or use it improperly. And so some of those topics I'll touch on here in today's training cafe. Um, first of all, I do have a shout out. Every episode, I have a training cafe shout out. This episode, the shout out is to all the medical workers, doctors, nurses, anybody in the medical profession, you guys are the front line in this war against the COVID-19 virus. And really, every day that you go to work at a doctor's office or clinic or hospital, you're literally putting your life on the lines uh, to fight this battle to save lives because of how contagious this virus is. I know here in the United States, I've heard in the last few days of numerous doctors and nurses who have gotten very sick and a few that have passed away because of their exposure, the high viral load, I guess, that they took on and could not resist. And so um, those guys are real heroes. And uh, if any of them are listening here that happen to be climbers as well, uh, thank you. Um, and so there is the shout out for this episode. Okay, so let's get on to, I'm going to try to go through three or four or five questions here in the next 20 minutes 
hopefully keep this tra training cafe to a half an hour in length. Um, question one that I received from several folks over the weekend was asking me, what am I doing for a weekend workout? What did we do here in the Hearst uh, family? You know, um, we all climb. My wife is a recreational climber. My sons are professional climbers. Uh, they are ages 17 and 19. They climb at a very high level, way harder than I do. Uh, they're young and strong. I'm old and kind of slowly falling apart, um, but still trying to train and climb hard. And uh, so, um, but we do train together often, you know, not, not always, but uh, this weekend we did for the most part. And so uh, we did two climbing specific workouts on both Saturday and Sunday. Now we have the home gym that has got a lot of different aspects and facets to it. So we have a lot of things we can pick and choose from that perhaps many of you don't have available, but you can be a creative and do a lot of the same things that we uh, do here in our gym. And so our Saturday workout, the focus was strength and power. Um, we, you know, I'm a big advocate of using uh, energy systems as a uh, conceptual model by which to organize our workouts and schedule our training for optimal effectiveness. Now, if you are a beginner climber, then you don't need to really go there. You can just do some basic training and climbing and get good results. But the more advanced you are as a climber, the more years you have logged in the gym training and at the crags climbing, then you do need more nuance and you do need to be more scientific with your training to get further results. Because the more advanced you get, the harder it is to eke out gains. And, and so you do need more nuance, new, um, you know, more highly um, personalized and really scientific training ideas that you're applying. And so energy system training is one of those powerful ideas that intermediate and advanced climbers can leverage to get better results. And that means you're training uh, one energy system per workout. Uh, and so Saturday, both of our workouts, the focus was kind of on the, the strength, power, power, endurance portion of the energy system continuum that goes from, you know, pure power to pure endurance. And so focusing on the strength, power end of the spectrum, that morning workout was all about um, high intensity, very brief bursts of power and uh, near maximum strength. No exercise lasting more than 10 seconds, many of them lasting only five seconds. Uh, and so that morning workout after a very lengthy warm up, a very uh, gradual progressive warm up that ends with us being fully turned on in terms of the nervous system. We went on and we did, you know, weighted fingerboard hangs using the 753 protocol that I described in the last video. Um, and so we did numerous sets of those weighted hangs. Now I do two hand weighted hangs. I'm not strong enough to do a lot of one arm uh, hang training, but I build up to doing uh, as much as a hundred pounds added uh, hanging from the loop on my harness on a loading pin. I have free weights. So I've been training for many years and able to build up uh, finger flexor strength that for me to get that high-end workout to do the 753 protocol, I am generally training with between 60 and 100 pounds added to my body. And by the way, I use a 14 millimeter transgression board edge. So a nice, you know, first pad edge to train on. Um, and that's what I do for my max hangs fingerboard uh, workouts. Now, my kids who are stronger than me, uh, especially strength to weight ratio, they're way stronger than me. Uh, they will warm up with some fingerboard hangs and add some weight on, you know, two arm hangs. But then they... Uh, when they're fully warmed up, shift to doing one-handed training because it gets impractical to keep adding weight to your body. Once you get to 50 kilograms or 100 pounds added to your harness, it's just too much weight to deal with. And you're at that point strong enough to start training with one hand on a fingerboard. 
Uh, now you need to have you know strong shoulders and scapular stabilizers to have proper positioning so that that it's safe. Um, and I posted a couple of videos on my Instagram over the weekend that you can see of my uh, son doing uh, some of his hangs. Um, he, when he's um, fully warmed up and 100% fresh, is now to the point of doing uh, one uh, hand hang on the Beast Maker middle edge, which is around 20 millimeters. Um, and training up to a 40 pound dumbbell on the other hand. So that's, that's real world class strength. I'm never going to get there and many, many others won't either, but that's something many years of training. And if you have the right genetics, you can get up to some crazy kinds of strength like that and, and doing those brief seven second, maybe even only five second hangs when you're training at that load. Uh, now, lots of rest between sets, between hangs. In fact, the strength power workouts, you spend most of your, your time resting, not training. So you're not getting pumped, zero pump, because again, every exercise is only five to at most 10 seconds in duration. Uh, after we go through all of our hangboard training, uh, and again, just doing max hangs, that's it. No repeaters, no moving hangs. We're staying focused on the anaerobic alactic energy system. After we go through our hangs, which might take us 45 minutes or so to go through and do uh, several sets of those hangs, then we go do our campus boarding. And so on the campus boarding, um, you know, I will do like one, four, six type movements. Uh, my kids will do some things that are a little bigger than that. And also they'll do some double dinos. Again, the efforts are very brief, five to 10 seconds at most. And then the rest are a few minutes in duration so that every effort is a quality effort. Uh, hangboard uh, and campus training, when you're working at your limit, pure strength, pure power, you wanna be pretty much fully rested between sets so you make quality efforts. And as fatigue begins to develop and build, you're done, you cut it off. Because you know if you're training fatigued, well, then it becomes more of an endurance training protocol, which isn't the goal of this workout. And if you're trying to do max movements and max hangs in a fatigue state, that tempts injury. So you don't want to go there either. And so that's pretty much that first workout. It's just pure strength, pure power. It's a pretty long workout because there's so much rest involved with it. So we did that over the course of about a two hour period on Saturday morning. And then we uh, have some lunch and rest. And then late in the day, we did our second workout of the day, which was more power endurance. And for that, we use our tread wall. And so Saturday afternoon, we do uh, an interval scheme that is a one minute all out on the tread wall, fairly small holds. We add a little bit of weight to our body to get the intensity up quickly. One minute all out on the tread wall, and then four minutes of recovery. And then one minute all out, four minutes of recovery. Of recovery and we do that 10 times so it's a total of 10 minutes of training the whole workout takes like 50 minutes to go through it all and that's it but it is a, a, a really focuses on um, the anaerobic um, a lactic and lactic energy systems and you do get some pump obviously you're kind of powering out before you fully pump out because it's not um, long enough to really get you massively pumped. But that 45 second to 60 second all out climbing um, interval is a good way to target kind of that high end power endurance like you would need for a hard boulder problem or a crux of a sport route. And so that was our Saturday workout, strength and power in the morning, and then kind of power endurance, high power endurance in the afternoon. And then Sunday, the other end of the spectrum was the focus. Sunday morning, we did four minute aerobic intervals on the tread wall. You could use a bouldering wall and just do laps for four minutes, um, but the intensity has to be low. You should not be getting massively pumped. We kind of shoot for an effort of seven out of 10. That tends to keep most people um, in the aerobic end of things. You get a light pump, yes, but not a massive pump. And so we climb four minutes, rest eight minutes. So the work to rest ratio is about one to two. And we repeat that around five times. So you get a lot of climbing volume in. 
this would be like going to the gym and doing uh, some roped climbing routes uh, that take you four minutes to climb and then you belay your partner to do a route and then you keep switching back and forth uh, in the gym setting. And if you're climbing submaximally, you can keep going like that without a lot of rest. And that really gives you a good cardiovascular workout and focuses on local endurance uh, in the climbing muscles. So we did that Sunday morning. And then later in the day, about six hours later, we did our second workout, which was more of a threshold workout where you, uh, our goal is to climb right near the anaerobic threshold, where the aerobic energy system is being maximally taxed and you are starting to dip into that anaerobic lactic um, uh, metabolism a little bit, but not going so deep that you get very ac acidic um, and very um, you know, maximally pumped. You're not trying to go there. Uh, and so the threshold interval protocol that we do on our tread wall uh, that we did Sunday afternoon is two minutes on, two minutes off, two minutes on, two minutes off. You keep going back and forth. So you're getting partial recovery during the two minutes of rest. And then the two minutes of effort, again, it's, it's the aerobic energy system is being fully taxed. It's kind of a high climbing specific VO2 kind of workout. Um, you get a little bit out of breath and you get moderately pumped, but again, never so pumped that you're falling off the wall, never so pumped that you're in tremendous pain. Um, you don't want to go that lactic. You want to be kind of right on the threshold between the aerobic and the anaerobic system. And again, they're both contributing perhaps about equally during these threshold intervals. And that gives you a good workout for training the aerobic energy system and its ability to take the lactate that is being generated from the anaerobic energy system and consume it aerobically. And that's a very important um, physical adaptation that uh, is especially important for rope climbers to be able to climb pumped, um, to be able to take the lactate from the aerobic or from the anaerobic system and then burn that off in the mitochondria via the aerobic energy system. And that's a beautiful metabolic system that our body's been designed to utilize, but you need to train it. And the threshold uh, protocols are a good way to do it. So that gives you some insight into our weekend training. Saturday was about strength and power, and then Sunday was more about uh, aerobic and, and uh, endurance training. And we are route climbers, uh, our family. We, that is kind of our preference. And so we can't just train strength. A hangboard isn't enough to get you fully in shape for rope climbing. Um, although for many folks, maybe a hangboard is the only tool you have. And there are, there are ways you can work around and do, as we discussed in the last video, some uh, moving hangs on the hangboard that kind of mimics those four minute uh, tread wall um, burns, but it's a boring thing to do on a hangboard. And a, a, a climbing wall doing laps or a tread wall where you can just keep moving upward is the ideal way to do it. Okay, so there's a long answer to a short question on how the Hearst family trained this past weekend. So let me move on to the next question. And um, several folks asking after the last video, um, how to train or how to schedule, if you're hangboard training, both strength and endurance, you know, how to do that. Should you do one week of strength training on the hangboard and one week of endurance training, or should you do them both in the same week or even in the same day? And um, I would not encourage doing them in the same day, uh, but in the same week, yes, especially if you have hopes of taking your climbing outside in the near future. It would be a great thing to try to keep all of your energy systems up and running as best as you can. And so that means having some diversity to your training and doing you know, a little bit of everything we discussed in the last training cafe. Uh, but how to organize that in a week? Well, if you're a beginner climber and for beginners, I think you should limit yourself to three days a week on your hangboard. I think any more than that tempts injury. You know, it, you, you might feel like you wanna do something every day, but that's a real dangerous thing to do. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, so if you're that beginner doing three days a week, I would do one day of like repeater training, which is 
more of a strength endurance protocol, and then maybe two days of max hangs. And then the next week, switch it and do two days of repeaters and one day of max hangs. And so you just kind of keep flipping back and forth week over week. Again, in aggregate, three sessions per week. Now, if you're on a more uh, advanced climber with more training history um, and feel confident that your tendons can take four days of hangboard training per week, then what I would recommend is doing two and two. Do two max hang workouts per week and then two of the more strength endurance workouts like the repeater protocols or the moving hangs. And a, a good way to schedule those would be, um, say on day one, do max hangs. And then the next day, do the repeaters. And then day three would be rest or antagonist muscle training or some other type of training that doesn't involve your fingers. And then day four, you're back to max hangs. Day five, you're back to repeaters and more endurance type training. Then day six, you're to your antagonist training or other types of training. And then maybe day seven is a day of more or less rest other than going for a walk or a bike ride or something like that. So that'd be a good way to schedule your workouts. Um, a, a, a true elite climber, like if there's some World Cup climbers listening, then they may have the conditioning and the tendon strength to do some double workouts, like maybe do a max hang workout in the morning and then do uh, a moving interval hang in the afternoon or evening, which would be more of an aerobic workout where they're not really loading the tendons all that hard. They're moving around the board with uh, less than body weight. Again, kind of simulating a climb and trying to get the aerobic energy system taxed in their forearms a little bit. And so that would be a good thing if you're going to do two sessions in a day would be to uh, do max strength. And then the other end of the spectrum uh, would be the uh, more local aerobic system training via moving hangs, or if you're on a bouldering wall, doing some moderate lapping on the wall where you climb for a few minutes um, and get a light pump, but nothing too fatiguing and nothing too stressful on the fingers. You know, when you're stuck at home, that's one thing you have to really watch out for is over straining your fingers. Uh, the last thing you want to do is end up getting injured. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, I want to try to blast through a couple more questions before we wrap up this episode. Um, somebody asked me about how they could integrate um, density hangs or density training hangs into the hangboard training protocol. And that's something that, um, you know, the whole concept of tendon training, I've talked a lot about the last couple of years. If you listen to my series of podcasts a year, um, about a year ago at this time, I talked quite a bit about the role you play in tendon ad adaptations, because when you're training, you're not just training the muscles. You are, in fact, training the connective tissues. In fact, there's some fabulous new research that's just come out in the last six months that when you work out, whether it's your arms or your legs, there is much collagen turnover um, in the connective tissues as there is protein turnover in the contractile fibers of the muscles. And so you really do have to consider that every workout you're training muscles and connective tissues. Um, and so density hangs are isometric hangs, long duration, 30 to 45 second hangs at moderate intensity. The goal of which is to focus on the connective tissues. And you know this is something that's well documented and utilized by physical therapists. If you go to them with a tendon injury, whether it's an Achilles tendon or a patellar tendon, or maybe you know um, elbow tendonitis, uh, any tendon problem, the first thing they'll prescribe to you, once you're kind of a past that you know, acute phase where you just need to have to ice the injury and be careful, once you're past that and you're in the rehab um, phase of your injury, they'll tell you to do um, high load, slow, long duration, eccentric or isometric holds. So if it's an Achilles injury, they'll have you doing calf exercises that are very slow, isometric, uh, or slow, eccentric 
exercises that are 30 to 45 seconds in length. And so uh, my friend Tyler Nelson's done some videos and has communicated beautifully uh, in recent months about doing density hangs um, on a hangboard or a pull-up bar where you hang in an isometric contraction um, for 30 to 45 seconds at a moderate load. And what that does is that gives you what's called a stress relaxation effect in the collagen fibrils of uh, your tendons and your ligaments. Um, there's long sustained holds. Um, the collagen actually creeps and the stress relaxation effect is a good way to get loading to the damaged tissue um, and to give a signal to the tenocytes. Those are the fibroblasts that actually extrude collagen and help heal and, and um, improve your injury. Or if you're not injured, it helps make your tendons stronger. It's a very slow adaptation, but it's something you can help encourage and help kind of um, signal or stimulate by doing these density hangs. And so you can, you know, if you're feeling pain in your tendons, these are the types of exercises you want to do. Those slow, longer duration hangs are therapeutic. Conversely, what you wouldn't want to do is anything fast, like a campus board or anything high load, like max hangs. You would not want to do that if you have painful tendons. You'd want to focus more on these slower, longer, moderate density hangs. Um, and, and again, if you talk to a physiotherapist, they're all over this stuff because they've been talking about this type of training for you know, many years, uh, though it hasn't been so much applied to climbing until recently. And so uh, if you're a totally healthy climber, there's not so much to be gained by doing a lot of that type of training. But if you are someone prone to injury or someone that's nursing injury or recovering from an injury, then actually the density hangs would be more the thing to do and stay away from the max hangs at this point in time. And a final comment one thing about those long isometrics or the, if you're doing a lot of long hangs, static hangs on a hangboard, is that the collagen, as it creeps, breaks crosslinks. And breaking crosslinks uh, decreases the stiffness of the tendon, makes them more compliant. And that's good from a health standpoint. That makes you more injury resistant. It's bad from a performance standpoint because to uh, exert power, to have a high rate of force development, if you're a jumper to jump high, if you're a climber to lunge long and to snag a hold quickly, to have that high rate of force development, you actually want stiffer tendons. And so uh, training that makes you stiffer, um, and that is plyometric type training, short, brief, um, explosive movements actually make tendons stiffer. You get more cross-linking. And so that's the type of training you want to do heading into performance season, heading into competition. I, in a podcast recently, talked about how you can tune the suspension of your body, that is the connective tissues, to perform uh, higher for competition, for your project. Um, and things like campus training are what will get you there. But the density training is the opposite of that. It actually breaks crosslinks and makes the tendons more compliant and more healthy and more resistant to injury, but they won't perform as highly. So you have to be careful. You don't want to do a lot of those long hangs if you are heading into performance season and if you are healthy. But if you are injured or in your winter training season and you want to develop more healthy tendons and connective tissues, then they are kind of a go-to thing to do. Okay, so enough there. I could do a whole podcast on this idea of connective tissue training, and perhaps I should in the near future do one of these training cafes. Uh, I have done podcasts on the topic, but maybe I can do a training cafe and get more into this sometime soon. And I see I'm up at about 30 minutes, so I want to kind of wrap this up real quick. And maybe a good way to do that, a good closing thought would be, this month of April, where we are all stuck indoors, or most of us are, are safe at home or strong at home indoors, let's put it that way, in a more positive way. We don't want that to turn into a nightmare in terms of us getting injured so that when we do get the all clear to start climbing outside or to start going to the climbing gyms again, we don't want to return injured. We want to return stronger and motivated so we can crush. 
And so that is something you need to be aware of here because you may be tempted since you have all this pent up energy and you're super motivated. And like me, I'm looking outside, it's blue sky, it's perfect climbing weather. Um, and so I'm, I'm very motivated. You don't want that motivation to push you over the top in your home training to have you do more fingerboarding than is appropriate or more pull-ups than are needed. Uh, you need to rest enough. You know, I always point out training is one side of the coin and the other side of the coin is nutrition and rest. Getting enough protein in the diet is super important to support the muscle protein synthesis and the collagen synthesis in your connective tissues. They're both turning over from training. They're both remodeling from training. And if you're starving yourself or if you're not eating a healthy diet, well, then you are hampering that recovery process. And if you're hampering the recovery process and then you're still hammering away at the training, that can slowly but surely send you into an overtraining syndrome or lead you down the path of getting some type of a connective tissue or muscle injury. And so please, dear listener, think about balancing your training with proper nutrition and adequate recovery. If you can sleep more than you're used to, that would be a great thing to help uh, um, support the recovery. And, you know, I've often joked on my podcast that the number one rule of Eric's Train Club, you know what the number one rule of Eric's Train Club is? Don't get injured, okay? If we get injured climbing, and it does happen, you get out there, you get in a weird position, and you tweak a finger, a shoulder, a knee. If it happens on a router or older, hey, at least it happened doing something that really counts, climbing outside. But if you get yourself injured hangboarding or doing something silly at home in the name of training, that's not good. And so as passionate as we are and as psyched as you are and I am about training, you want to always try to pull back on the reins, you know? And so when you start to feel all those tendons hurting, it's time to end your training session. If you wake up on some morning and you have a workout scheduled, but your fingers still hurt, or maybe your elbow or shoulder hurts or something weird about your body, is a, giving you a signal, listen to the signal. Don't ignore the signal. Take the day off. Do stretching, foam rolling, go for a run, go for a walk, but delay the next climbing workout by one day, and then reevaluate. Be prudent, be smart, and you will finish up April hopefully stronger than you started it. The last thing we want you to do is to get injured uh, during this uh, quarantine period of at-home training. And so I'm over my 30-minute self-imposed limit here, so I guess it's time to wrap things up. I'll have another training cafe for you on Thursday. Let's meet together and sip some coffee. But until then, well, be safe, be strong, first out.